Welcome to a very special edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with the legendary alto saxophonist Charles McPherson. He's originally from Joplin, Missouri, but he got baptized in the jazz while living in Detroit as a boy. And he got some sage advice in life and in the great art of jazz from Barry Harris, along with witnessing amazing cats like Miles Davis play live. He spent 12 years with the great and explosive Charles Mingus and has played with a huge host of luminaries and jazz cats over the years. He's getting ready to release a new album called The Journey in February 2015, and the journey through his life is rich and interesting, and we discussed it at length. Charles possesses an amazing arsenal of story, intelligence, and warmth. He's a jewel in the annals of jazz history. It was our pleasure, so please dig this interview, my friends. Hello, Charles McPherson here. Yeah, hi, Charles. It's Joe Domino with Neon Jazz. Yeah, hey, Joe. How you doing? How are you, sir? Very good, very good. Thanks for calling. Hey, thank you for taking a little time out to talk with us. No problem. I'm going to go ahead and start off, off the bat here, about what's been going on lately. Talk to me about your brand new album, The Journey. Yeah, well, it, it was an album uh, that was done in Denver uh, a few months back, and, um, uh, uh, there's a club called Dazzled, a very nice jazz club, and um, I was working there, and uh, some of the musicians that were in the rhythm section uh, at the club, um, and also one of the uh, tenor players that was playing with me, we all decided to maybe do a, to record uh, our our gig, or, or record, just record our uh, getting together. And so, uh, and then there's a company in there called Capri, uh, owned by uh, Tom Burns. And uh, he was interested in recording the group. And so that's what we did. So we worked the club. Mm -hmm. We only worked a couple days. And then we were in the studio for a day or so, and we, re you know, we recorded. And uh, the musicians were, you know, good musicians, uh, fun people to play with. And... Uh, so why not document it? And that's what we did. Right on. I've got an advanced copy. It's a beautiful album. Oh, thank you so much. Absolutely. And I was curious, too, about this Afro-Cuban jazz ballet, the Sweet Synergy Suite. Talk to me a little bit about that. Okay, now this came about... Um, well, first of all, my daughter is a ballet dancer with the San Diego Ballet, one of the ballet companies here in San Diego. Yeah. So she's a she's a professional dancer, and I, you know I was the one taking her back and forth to ballet lessons since she was about four years old. Mm -hmm. Okay, so she turned into the ballerina. Yeah. And she she was with this company. Now this came about by way of a, a grant that uh, there's a, 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 a it's called the San, San Diego Foundation Creative Catalyst Fund. Now these people fund artists in the in the San Diego area, uh, and they bestow money, uh, you know, so grant money. Now, in order for the grant to be satisfied, uh, these people ex want you to partner with one other artist, and uh, the partnership is supposed to bring about uh, a project uh, that reflects. Um, both partners doing something out of the box, something out of the ordinary, out of their comfort zone. Sure. So for me, since I'm a musician and I'm, you know, I play and I write music, okay, the dance company and the choreographer, they, you know, he, you know, he uh, constructs dances. So the uh, out of the box for both of us was for me to write for a ballet. And the kind of music that I'm writing is, is you know, I'm a bebop jazz musician. So I just um, decided to, uh, to, to play Afro-Cuban music along with the bebop and uh, write for ballet, you know, movement. And uh, that's my, you know, this is something I don't normally do. At least I don't have to write for dance. And the choreographer is basically a classical ballet guy writes usually uh, ballet moves for, you know, classical ballet and that genre. But now he's dealing with Afro-Cuban Latin rhythms and jazz rhythms. 
So that's his out of the comfort. Uh, his, uh, you know, that's, you know, making him be out of the, his comfort zone there. Sure. And that's what the grant wanted, the grant wanted that. It wanted you to do something you don't normally do and to partner with someone else. So, okay. So part of satisfying the grant was to put on a workshop. Cool. After the project is completed. Okay, so we did that already last April. Right on. Now, this dance company decides to put on this whole thing during their regular season, which will be in February. And uh, so that's what we're going to do. So that project project came about by way of my dancer being with the company and, and then me partnering with partnering, partnering, being a partner with these people. The choreographer, his, uh, his name is Javier Velasco, very, very, very smart, uh, talented man, who was able to uh, put together dance moves to go with my music. So we're coming out of Kansas City here. You're relatively local from Joplin. Talk to me a little bit about... Is that where you, is that where you are in Kansas City? Yes, sir. Yeah, we're in Kansas City, Missouri. Oh, oh great, great. Okay, well, I'm, yeah, I'm from Joplin, Missouri. I, I was born there. And uh, I moved from Joplin uh, in 1948 to Detroit, and then the rest of my uh, childhood was in Detroit. And, and that's what I was going to get to. You, you, they said that you saw some festivals in the early years when you were there in Joplin. What were those like? How did the jazz move you in those early years in Joplin? Well, you know, the, I mean, and, uh, these early years means I was probably five, six, seven, eight years old. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, there was a park in Joplin, Missouri, where every, uh, what's it, I think uh, uh, August, uh, they had a celebration called Emancipation Day, okay, mm -hmm. and that was celebrated in this park, in the uh, African American community, and what they would do, uh, they would, you know, it would be a gala affair, but they would always have bands, probably territorial bands, you know, in fact, most definitely uh, the bands that were in the uh, Midwest, South South Central, USA, you know. Um, so I'm sure these bands were from Kansas City and Oklahoma and all those places like that. So these were the kind of bands that would play this this uh, park and this particular uh, event every uh, August. And I was enamored of the music, of course, and certainly of the uh, it's shiny brass instruments. And uh, so that was my first exposure to, uh, you know, live jazz music at a very early age. And um, so I, I always uh, liked it, uh, I, but I didn't really start playing music myself until we moved from Joplin to Detroit in 1948, and I was about nine years old, ten years old, and um, I didn't start playing until um, junior high school. And I was 13, I'm see, 12 years old, and I started playing in the band. And yeah. Then, and that was, from that point on, I played trumpet first, and then a year later at 13, I played saxophone. And from that point on, uh, I, I, was, I knew I wanted to play music. Introduced to Charlie Parker by a young, uh, young guy in, band, in the band who already knew about Bird, and I did. He sort of told me about him, and I heard him. Box, and that's when I fell in love with it, all of it. So when you heard Charlie Parker for the first time, did it just yeah. blow your top? Was it like, oh my God, this is... Oh yeah, definitely. Well, I was about 14 years old, and I heard this record. It was Tico Tico, one of the records Bird made with Norman Grant in those days. And it was just, uh, I think it was a series of recordings that those that were, uh, were at, what would you call it, uh, South of the Border. They were named South of the Border. So it's dealing with Latin and Afro-Cuban rhythms and you know, Machito and uh, Chico Farrell and all those people. Um, and so that was one of the first records I heard of Bird was Tico Tico. And I, immediately I became very enamored of not only of, of Bird, and, and, uh, but also that whole genre of music. So I, uh, this, now I discovered that, yes, this is jazz, and it's a certain kind of jazz played by uh, a bunch of people who play that genre of jazz. Well, at that point, then I wanted every record I could find, not only of Charlie Parker, but of anybody that played that kind of music. So it was Charlie Parker, Miles, uh, you know, uh, 
Dizzy Gillespie, Stan Gett, uh, Stan Kenton, you know, uh, you know, all these people. And then uh, uh, just that genre, they call it progressive jazz and bebop and whatever you want to call it in yeah. those days. And it was kind of, you know, the next new music after swing in the big band. And I just fell in love with that whole genre and the players that played it. And so from that point on, I'm seeking records out, finding out who plays this. And then I find out there's a club right down the street from my house. I can walk there in five minutes that features that kind of music. And this is in Detroit. The club is called Bluebird. Yeah. Wow. And uh, from that point on, I'm 14, 15 years old. I'm, and, uh, you know, it's like, okay, right down the street from my house is, is where this music is played. And it's a great local jazz club. The uh, musicians who played in that uh, in that club were the house band was Elvin Jones on drums, Pepper Adams baritone, Thad Jones trumpet. A slew of people that would come through there, like uh, Sonny Skid or Miles, or uh, there was a great tenor player named Billy Mitchell that played there all the time, wow. or Del Gray. So all these great jazz musicians. With uh, the, the, a lot of them lived in Detroit, so they played there. And then people coming through from New York would play there as well. So I'm in heaven at wow. this point. And yeah. I, I'm too young to get in. I just stand outside the place and listen. But uh, that was my early beginnings. And then I met Barry Harris, who was the pianist in this club. And he happened to live right around the corner, and I started uh, studying with him. By the time I was uh, 19, I was playing professionally. And then, uh, you know, I played around town, you know, uh, colleges and dances and proms. And, uh, and then I, I was able to play in some of the clubs. I, you know, put on a little mascara on my uh, mustache and look a little older because I wasn't 21. Yeah. One. And then I went to New York and got started working with Mingus in 1960. Wow. What what was it like to be around Barry Harris? What did he teach you about life? Well, he was a real he was an excellent teacher about music. So I learned a lot about harmony and, uh, and theory and you know things about music. Uh, in terms of life, he he opened up a door, an intellectual door that I I didn't care know so much about. And basically, he he created. In a sense of reading habit, because I was 14, it's not like I read a lot of books, other than, you know, books you read in school. But uh, because he was a, a person that was pretty enlightened in a lot of ways, other than just music, he, um, he actually instigated uh, that kind of thing in me as well, because he would, uh, one day I came in, this is sort of an interesting story, and I had my report card, he he saw it. He said, hey, let me see your re your card, your report card. <laughs> so I showed him the card. It was a bunch of C's. You know, in those days, it was A, B, C, D, you know. Yeah. I don't know what it is now. But uh, anyway, so C is like the average grade, right? So the whole report card was C's everywhere. No A's, no B's, just C's. <laughs> and he saw that. He said, well, you, you, you're kind of an average guy, aren't you? You know, <laughs> and I didn't even hear the insult at that. I'd say, well, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm not below average, so I'm okay. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and so he says, well, no, nah, I've got to tell you something. The kind of guys that you admire, these musicians that you respect, are anything but average. Mm -hmm. These are guys, these are, you're not going to be an average guy or student and be able to play this kind of music. Maybe some other kind. But not this, because you got to have too much stuff going to be able to, to have um, the weather at all, to play, negotiate all these rhythms and harmony and then be creative and think on your feet and all this stuff. It's anything but ordinary and average. There's no C student stuff here. So all these people that you like, Charlie Parker, and that these kind of people, basically these people are, are actually brilliant. You, you're going to have to tighten up your game. <laughs> now, when he said that to me, that was a first. I never, that meant more coming from him than it would my parents, you know. Yeah. And because here's a guy that, oh, he's a hero and I respect him. And, he, and, uh, and it was like, oh, really? And so from that point on, I started to read. And he would say, uh, now, 
to see you do the puzzle. So he was a guy who did the New York Times puzzle all the time. Yeah. And he could do it fast, Sunday puzzle, you know, half hour. Yeah. So he's this kind of guy. And, was, you know, he knew words and all these weird, you know, words you have to look. And so he said, you see, you start doing that. And when you see something, a word you don't know, look in the dictionary. And yeah. so I started doing it because he said it, you know? Yeah. And so after a while, I'm, I'm learning all these odd words that are, you know, dictionary words, scrabble words, you know. And uh, and then I would listen to uh, the musicians that would come over to his house, and they would all talk music, but every now and then they'd talk about things that had nothing to do with music. So there would be conversations about Nietzsche, Schopenhauer, uh, Emmanuel Kant, Kant, uh, Bertrand, it would be uh, Spinoza, it would be these, uh, Anne Rand, it would be conversations dealing with politics, philosophy, uh, sometimes uh, it would be about uh, quantum mechanics, and I'm saying, well, damn, I, I had no clue that, you know, these people who would know, would be this eclectic, or this, have as much dimension as people, because I'm just thinking of them as jazz musicians, so this was impressive me also, and then I started reading about quantum mechanics and, you know, Max Planck and, uh, you know, this and that and uh, the different, you know, Nietzsche and what is he talking about? What is his slant on things? And, you know, because they're doing it. And yeah. This is how Detroit musicians were. They were like really smart, brilliant people that could play, but these people were well-rounded as people, you know, not just music. These, these guys were really something. And they were impressive for a guy 14, 15 years old. And so when I saw that, I, I you know, I said, well, the me, okay, I want to be in with this. And so I did. So I never thought that way as a kid. You know, I didn't care anything about that. But by the time I was out of high school, I was like an A student. <laughs> you know, my report card was all... You know, like the teachers couldn't believe it because they already had me pigeonholed as a, oh, he's a fair student, that's it. Yeah. And then all of a sudden these A's start popping up. <laughs> and I can remember one of the homeroom teachers in it because they, they were handing out the report cards and they saw my card, they saw these A's. And they were like, Charles, come here. And I, well, what happened? You got all these A's? And I, of course, I didn't say all of what I'm saying to you. I, I just said, well, yeah, I just decided to sort of tightened up a little. And they were like, oh, that's beautiful. Anyway, so that was, last two years of high school, I just sailed through there. I mean, just totally changed my life. So Barry Harris and jazz music actually changed the course of how I thought, not only musically, but in general. Yeah, absolutely. So by the time you're 19 and you get your first bit of live performing, were you nervous? How did you go into your first real live gig? Well, uh, well, you know, uh, uh, yes, I was nervous, but I was, I was well, sort of well prepared because I would go over to Barry's house every day, lived right around the corner, and we learned all the, you know, American songs, but we learned standards, we learned jazz, we learned harmony, and we, so you, we became very well prepared. So when it came to playing gigs, we were prepared, you know, we, we played dance music and we knew the tunes to play. Now, when I first started working with Mingus, this is the beginning of, of if you will, like an international career. What a name, man. Uh, this was the beginning of, you know, some, you know, <laughs> this is the beginning of it. Stress, happiness, and everything else. So uh, I worked with Mingus and, uh, for about 12 years, and Mingus uh, was a very difficult guy to work for. He was very confrontational and, and sort of, what would you call it, uh, explosive. You know, he could be, and um, but brilliant, and uh, his music was you know, insightful. And so I learned a lot about composing. Uh, that was the thing that impressed me most about Mingus, his composition. You know. And I worked with him 12 years off and on. And um, yeah, basically, I, I cut my professional teeth, at least in beginning in New York with Mingus. Right on. 
What now, now, you played with a lot of other people over your career. Paul Chambers, Tommy Flanagan, Duke Jordan. The, the list goes on and on and on. Are there any that really stick out in your brain, like Mingus, where you really learned a lot, you really kind of cultivated some very core senses of jazz and arranging and playing and composing? Are there any in that list that really leap out? Uh, well, all of them. You know, everything informs everything else. <clears throat> your whole musical life or your life period. You know, every little thing, big or small, contributes to the, the, the whole. Uh, so it's hard to say. I mean, certainly the experience with Mingus, because it was 12 years, pretty much. Um, that was insightful uh, because uh, of who he is and uh, who he was. And uh, in terms of uh, composition, I think I, I really learn or I was influenced by him to uh, a degree uh, in that way and Barry Harris certainly is uh, another very strong per personality in my musical uh, life and beginnings um, the journey on the way playing with different people um, I, all of it was was, was interesting I, you know I remember uh, certain things that left an impression on me that, are, that I remember to this day. So everybody, you know, these people are wonderful people, really. And they, uh, you know, when you are around them, you know, there are tidbits of information, nuances, and things that you remember. You know, musical phrases are, you can picture them a particular evening uh, with this person or that person. And it's all informing the, per you know, you, meaning me, you know. So, um... Yeah, you know, I've worked with Jamie Chan, for instance, the piano player that Bird played with. Yeah. Um, we had a gig once in Europe, and, uh, Jay, and we were on the bandstand. And they were, there were some kind of problems with, there were, there were technical problems with, with the sound. So we couldn't start performing right away. We, um, we had to wait, you know, say five minutes or so, if not a little longer, until this the glitch, our glitches, they were taken care of. So you got a whole band. It was a big band. I remember that. And Jamie Chan was the pianist. So we're on stage. The people are in the audience waiting. And everybody knows that there's a couple of technical things that have to be taken care of. So while that was happening, Jamie Chan started to meander on the piano. Hmm. Nothing in particular. He's, he's just taking up time and sort of doing something while everyone, including the audience, waiting for things to be finished. Now, the thing about it is, what he was meandering with on the piano was nothing to do with how you think of Jay McShane, the blues player from Kansas City, because he's a great blues player, right? Yeah. Everything that he was, he was just roaming around the piano, and it basically was Debussy, Debussy. Yeah. You know, and it was this gorgeous music meandering in this or either like Chopin with all this whole vibe if you will Yeah. and it was like everybody in the band looked and we were like damn you wouldn't even think that a guy like Jay McShann <laughs> would even um, you know it wouldn't be on his radar to even think this or even do this on the piano but it was Yeah. and I never forgot that it was like wow the world thinks of this guy as the blues guy, and he is that, but boy, he's got a lot more dimension than what most people know, and it was impressive because it was good, yeah. you know, and yeah. I was in, so that's just one moment, it only lasted, what, five minutes, but I'll never forget it, Wow. because it was, it was gorgeous, you know, and it was unexpected, so, you know, little things like that happen over the course of 50 years all over the place, you know. Yeah, that's a beautiful story. So, yeah. As a musician, you've always been uh -huh. a growing, innovating force in jazz. What is your key? What's your music philosophy? Well, my music philosophy is, um, well, let me see how you say this. <clears throat> it's a journey, you know, uh, 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 music, okay, music is for night. You know, there are, you know, there are only so many chords, so many scales. And uh, so it's for night, it, you know, it's there, and uh, there is, uh, you know, there are 12 notes in the chromatic scale, uh, at least in Western music. One can learn the elements in the infrastructure, 
and all of this stuff about music. But the, that's not even, the main event is, it's a really a journey into yourself, a journey in self. And I mean, what I mean by that is it becomes getting the best out of yourself. And that is, uh, that's, you know, that's a state of becoming. Music has already become, the elements are there. Uh, the person, the human being that's using music uh, to express, that is, is, that the journey is of the human being, the evolution of personality and consciousness within the individual person. That becomes, that's the war, or if you will, the, 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 that is the uh, thing to conquer is self. You know what I mean? So, yeah. So that's the fun of it. And the other thing of it is, when you think of music, uh, not only uh, in, in a template, say a Western template or an Eastern template or any of these types of music that, that's reflected around the world, if you just think of the notes, period, you know, a D is a D. I don't care if it occurs in the... Uh, you know, in rock and roll art, it's a D that uh, Bach play. A D is a D in the yeah. scale. Okay, so you got, you know, but when you look at music beyond that, you're looking at it as a phenomenon, a universal phenomenon, in fact, a cosmic phenomenon. And that's how I actually look at tone and music, because all it is is vibration, you know. Yeah. And so a famous scientist once said, the phenomenal physical universe, as we know it, basically is frozen music. And he's actually, that's exactly right, because everything is vibrating. Everything is moving. Yeah. There's no such thing as solidity yep. or non-movement. Everything is moving. You know, electron, physical matter is a bunch of electrons and stuff bouncing and shimmering and vibrating all over the place. Yeah, well, absolutely. all I know this is exactly that. You know, A440 on the piano means 440 cycles per second. Mm -hmm. That's what makes A, A, and not D. Yeah. D is vibrating at, okay. So the whole the whole universe is, a, is vibrating some sort of way. So it's music, you know? Uh, okay, so now I look at it, I look at music in a cosmic way, not just a, a local way, or it's, it's, a, it's a cosmic universe, it's a, it's a cosmic phenomenon in a way. So I look at it that way, and then I look at the evolution of personality and personal style in terms of the human factor. So I'm thinking of that that in terms of myself, and then I'm thinking of the, the, the whole music universe, you know, cosmic way of thinking of vibration. So all of it is one to me, and so the journey is how do you take vibration tones sequence them, rhythmically do this or that with them, and uh, how many thousands of ways can you find ways to do things? Wow. And that's the fun of it for me. You know? Yeah. That's awesome. That's 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 amazingly cool. I love love the way you orchestrated that. That's great. Yeah, and, and it sounds corny. You know, it sounds like nineteen sixty. You know, but it's really the truth. I mean, this is really how I think about it. No, that's just a brilliant way of looking at it. That's the way I see it. So in nineteen eighty eight. Clint Eastwood's yeah. film Bird, you got to be the sax voice and you got to play Parker. What was yeah. that like to come full circle after all these years in the realm of bebop and and looking up to, to Bird and then playing him? Was that totally cool? Well, it was very interesting. At this point, you know, I, um, I'm more, because uh, I mean, I've been in love with Bird, so that, you know, there's nothing, there's no other, yeah. So for me, the project, just to, to try to do the project, it, do a good job, that became, that this is what I'm actually thinking about. And, and so the experience was different because this, um, this is Hollywood and you're, doing, you're dealing with movies and, and soundtrack and what they call click tracks. And, um, and that's a whole different way of using music. And so that was interesting. I met Clint Eastwood, he was there uh, at the record. I, I wasn't at any of the footage of the, uh, when they were shooting the film, but I, you know, when they recorded some of the soundtrack, I'm in the studio. I did tutor the, the, the actor, Forrest Whitaker, on how to look like he's playing the saxophone. Yeah. 
and uh, you know how to hold it. He so you know he had to try to do a good job of blowing because uh, a lot of times it would be burnt. Some of the things they were able to use of Charlie Parker. Mm-hmm. Some things they were not because of the technology or either copyright uh, problems or this you know that kind of thing. And though that's when I was used. Gotcha. And they couldn't technically use but technically use bird or if there were problems with the uh, copyright or something. You know, or when there wasn't any footage or any documentation. For instance, there was a scene of Charlie Parker and Red Rodney playing at the, in the uh, up in the mountains in New York for some of the, the, the Jewish resorts up there. <clears throat> uh, Red Rodney and Bert did do that. That really happened, and um, there's no uh, documentation. None of that was recorded. But Clint Eastwood featured that you know that in in the film, the purpose of the part of the film. And so I was used for that, you know. Yeah. And then basically it was a scene in there about a Jewish wedding, you know. Yeah. And uh, and Bird and, and, and Red Rodney actually did play a wedding up there. In wow. The mountains, you know. And uh, so I was used for that because there's no documentation of Charlie Parker playing that or Red Rodney. But yeah. it happened. You know. So so little scenes like that. Um, another interesting scene was... Um, this actually happened. Charlie Parker was riding in the car with a, a lady, and they were riding around in Hollywood in that Beverly Hills, you know, rich section. And they were looking at all the mansions of the movie stars and all that. It was in the evening. And they came, and Bird didn't have a hell of a lot of interest. You know, he's just kind of looking, oh, yeah, he's Douglas Fairbanks' his house. Or one. But when he came to Stravinsky's house, he wanted to stop. He said, oh, wait, wait, let me stop. So they stopped. This really happened. And uh, Bert sort of got out of the car and just stared at the house for a few moments, you know, because this is Igor Stravinsky's house. Mm-hmm. And he looked and uh, he got back in the car and they, they went on, you know. <clears throat> but uh, so Clint Eastwood used this. So what he did, he had an idea, and this happened in the studio, is when this was happening in the film, Sean Bird looking at Stravinsky's house, they played Stravinsky's Firebird Suite. And I superimposed imposed just Kansas City blues right on top of that. Wow. So that was kind of a novel and a very ethereal kind of an effect to hear Stravinsky, um, you know, his Starbird tweet, and then hearing this Kansas City Charlie Parker type blues, you know, superimposed on this on Stravinsky's tune. Yeah. And that brought about a very ethereal, very interesting kind of a, the whole thing was interesting. It was clearly not his idea to do that. I thought that was artful and, and very uh, effective for that scene right there. So, you know, it was used that way. Well, let me ask you a question. Do you like being famous? Well, I'm not that famous, you know, so it's not like when you say uh, famous, you know, you got these levels of infamy, if you will. So... It's not like I'm uh, Lady Gaga, you know, or, uh, you know, uh, or, uh, you know, uh, George Clinton, you know, where I'm so famous that I, I can't eat in a restaurant without somebody coming up. I'm, so, you know, I'm well known within the world of jazz, and that's tolerable. I mean, uh, that's not so that it interferes with your comfort, you know what I'm saying? It's not like being a rock star or something, so... I don't mind people, you know, the few people, the few jazz fans that there are in the world for me to have some notoriety. That's not a problem. But now, I will say this. It in itself has no meaning for me. Right. You know, I mean, it's not like my, let me see, how do you put this? It's my, the kind of, you know, everybody's got an ego, but it's, everybody's ego is, is different, you know? Yeah. Um, my e- egoic, whatever you want to call it, e- e- it's not like I get off on that on, on anything being you know famous or that, that I might get off. My ego might work a different way, but that one it doesn't really say it does. I'm not there with that. I don't care about that really. You know. Sure. Sure. Um, I tell you what I do. Uh, my egoic. Uh, you know, whatever you want to say about that, is I really like being respected by other musicians. Yeah. This means more to me 
then if somebody, if Joe the plumber knows me or not. So my ego is that way, you know. Uh, however, if Joe the plumber likes me, then I'm okay with that. <laughs> for sure, you know what I mean? Yeah. But I, I get off on, you know, some saxophone player, some musician says nice things about me. I feel good about that. Yeah. So there's, you know, so that's where my thing is. Right on. What What's one of the nicest things a fan has ever said to you or done for you? Well, some of the nice things that make a guy like me feel good would be if they come, I meet somebody in a jazz club, and this has happened before, and they say, you know, I never really liked jazz, and I've never really been to a jazz club or heard jazz live. And this really, I, 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 this really moved me. I had no idea that this, I just, this, I, you know, really moved me. Now that makes me feel good because this person is not so inclined to care about what you're doing anyway. And for them to say that, it means that uh, you, me, meaning me, I might have a quality that transcends somebody who's already. Uh, inclined, you know, which makes a guy like me feel like there are elements of what I might want to do musically or how I express music that has some universal appeal and not just to the esoteric few. Yeah. So that for a person like me makes me feel good because if you can make a person like that, uh, then that means maybe you do have a, a nuance of universal appeal, some sort of way. And that's great to me. I mean, I like that. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I certainly like to appeal to the base. <laughs> if we were talking about politics, I certainly want to appeal to my base. Yeah. <laughs> but if I can make somebody who's independent like me, I'm part of it. Yeah, right on. Yeah. What's the greatest thing about waking up every day? Well, waking up. Yeah. Yeah, that's the one. The, and to wake up and feel good physically. Yeah. That's great. Because you can wake up and not feel good. Yeah. So I would say to wake up and actually feel. Uh, it feels great to wake up and not have any deep, dark shadows or, or, or forebodings over your head that, that's, you know, roomy. Let's, let's say that. Yeah. You know? Right on. And uh, enjoy that while you can. Yeah. Because believe you me, if you live long enough, there's going to be some dark shadows and some, you know, some looming negativity that's looming. So to wake up and not have that is great. Amen. Uh, yeah, and to feel good of mind and spirit and body. That's a wonderful thing. Yeah. And you don't know how wonderful it is until you don't have it. Yeah, true. So while you got it, celebrate it. Right on. Okay. So right. that's a wonderful thing. The other thing is to pursue what it is that you want to do. I mean, you, I think you, you're supposed to get up. And uh, let's assume that, you know, that you, you're free of, of all this shadowy stuff we're talking about right now. And so uh, you, you just pursue your goal, whatever it is. You know? And it's a bunch of little goals that need to be, yeah, you know, you just... Yeah, it's just to the acquisition of of finishing whatever it is you need to finish. I don't care if it's raking the grass, if it's finishing a tune, or finishing an article, or finishing a, a, anything. Just, I mean, to have something to do and then complete complete it to a point, you know, and and to just to have this feeling of a liquidity of a. I don't know. It's just, it's just like movement, you know, movement, things being done. And, uh, you know, so for me, I, I just try to, uh, uh, if I can have a good practice day, practice three or four hours, uh, maybe write a tune, uh, taking care of some kind of business, and then that's it. Right know? on. And that's then me. next day is, yeah, so it's not just, Trying to be happy and productive, basically. That's really it. Trying to be productive and and, and, and basically happy. That's you know, cool. Or, yeah, well, let's put it that yeah. way. Yeah. So speaking of accomplishments, 
and your legendary career, what is left to accomplish for you? Well, as I said before, the journey is, is uh, the whole, to me, uh, uh, it's not just music, it's uh, the journey. Uh, it's, it's my sound corny too, but I think that uh, the journey is, is like basically the evolution of consciousness for each individual. And music, I mean, I have to do, I mean, music is my game in terms of how I take care of myself and what I want to do is my passion. Um, but it all is, it all alludes to a, 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 a journey, a life journey, if you want to call it that. And in some kind of way, whether it's on purpose or not, or even known by the person, it, it's, it's like evolution of consciousness in some sort of way. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, you don't even have to know it. I mean, you don't have to be cognizant of it yeah, because it's going on whether you know it or not. Yeah. Whether, whether it's right up in the front, the frontal, frontal lobes or it's <laughs> back somewhere in the subconscious, but that's what's happening, you know. Um, so I don't know if we're humans on a spiritual journey or a spirit people on a human journey, whichever way you want to look at it. But some kind of way I get a feeling it is a journey. Yeah. And uh, it's just the, the evolving of thought yeah. and um, and how you use it which in, you know which it affects behavior how you behave and uh, now it, I could be totally wrong it could be nonsense none of this could make sense uh, you know it could be just not, you know no sense no symmetry to none of it and it very well could be that way but I get the feeling that uh, it is some kind of evolution of consciousness going on I got one last question for you. Yep. What, what would be one really cool thing about Charles McPherson the world may not know about that you wouldn't you wouldn't mind letting them know about? Well, let me see. I don't know if what I you know I don't know if it would be interest, interesting to anybody. Um, it's a hard one. Um, I don't know if I really care what say you know what what the, the world like. You know I don't know if I I never thought of that. Um, I guess I'm egotistical enough to want people to like me. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, that doesn't hurt, you know. I don't want people to not like me. So that's kind of nice. So I I guess, but that's something I wouldn't want to tell the world. Right. You know what I mean? Because it's self-serving. is another form of egotism. Uh, so I don't know if I would want to tell the world that. Um, the only, let me see. Here, uh, here's we were talking about the journey and the, you know, about music and the cosmos and how it fits in with human behavior and what it's all about and all of that. Um, I, I guess, and I don't really care if the world knows it or not, but, but I, my whole thing is that it's like music is what I do, but it's informed by how I'm thinking about this human journey we talked about in evolution. How do I fit in with the cosmos, not of this of the planet, but but the whole thing? You know, every the, the, the galaxy, the everything. Who in the hell are we? Yeah. So my, you know, who are we? Why? What? What is it? What's this? Does any of it make sense? Is there some kind of? Are we supposed to do this, or how are we? And so I, I'm always I'm always thinking of that, and I'm always thinking of music. Mm. So that's really who I am. I mean, I'm all thinking, I'm, my head is always in the, in the clouds about those things. I'm not very mundane where I, I'm down to earth and I'm sort of thinking about, let me see how I'm going to get this next dollar. I should be that, maybe. <laughs> um, but uh, if I were a rich man and I could push a button, uh, I, would, I would be doing exactly what I'm doing. I would be playing music and not worrying about money. And I would be thinking about the cosmos, and not thinking I'm wasting time. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, so, but in terms of the people, um, I guess um, I would want. To re- re- let me see, I don't know. I can't. I don't know if I can. Answer. I th- I think you did answer it. I think you just did. I think that's the answer. Well, I mean, I'm a seeker, but you know, even if I'm a fool, I am a seeker. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't mind the world knowing that. Yeah. No, that's a great answer. 
That's a great answer. Yeah. Charles, you spent some quality time with me today, and I really appreciate it. Oh, man, you're a fascinating cat, man. I love your music, and just getting to know you a little bit more is just adding to the beauty of your music. I appreciate you spending a little time with me. All right, thank you so much. Thanks for listening and tuning in to yet another Neon Jazz interview where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players in San Diego, New York, KC, and spots all over America, giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to the legendary Charles McPherson for his cool wit, stories, and his time. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino on the iTunes Store. Or for all things Neon Jazz, you can visit the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the music, my friends. Neon Jazz.